I've long known that there's something missing from the history of North America, something big. Go to Europe and the evidence for millennia of civilization are impossible to miss. Cities and castles and cathedrals from the Middle Ages, empires from 2,000 years ago, temples from before the time of Christ. Return to the U.S. and the main historical attractions all date to the 1600s or later. Places like Plymouth Plantation, Paul Revere's house, Mount Vernon, Monticello, Vicksburg, Gettysburg. In school, I learned a detailed history for the origins of European civilization, beginning with the Minoans and Mycenaeans thousands of years ago, then the classical Greeks, then the Romans, then Attila the Hun, then the Middle Ages, and eventually Columbus and the Pilgrims. For North America, I learned a history where Columbus and the Pilgrims were the start of the story, not the end. I learned in great detail about the first Thanksgiving, the 13 colonies, the American Revolution, Manifest Destiny in the Wild West, the Civil War. I learned who the Europeans encountered as they pushed west, Wampanoag and Iroquois and Shawnee and Lakota and Apache and Nez Perce and so on. But I never learned their history. What happened in North America in the thousands of years before Europeans arrived? Where are the monuments, the ruins of cities and temples and empires from the ancient past? I've since learned that some of the evidence is right under our noses. Some of the history has been in print for centuries, but ignored because it comes from native sources. Some of it hasn't been ready to be revealed until now. My name is Nathaniel Jensen. I'm the research biologist with Answers in Genesis, and this is the lost history of North America. My goal is to recover the history of the pre-Columbian Americas and to restore to the indigenous people and their ancestors the respect and honor that they deserve. Just this past December, I was at the Lakota Treaty Council Conference where I was invited to speak on genetics and Native American history. It's a topic that has caused much angst, hurt, and even anger in times past. My hope is that our time together will be a help and not a hindrance. In this video, I want to speak directly to Native American tribal and national leaders, to those considering what to do with DNA testing, and share with you what I shared with the Lakota in December. If you're not in any of these demographic categories, maybe you're just Caucasian and you're interested, you're welcome to listen in. In fact, you do me a great favor if you'll share this video far and wide so that those interested in doing DNA testing among the Native American community might see it. By way of organization, I'm going to list my seven recommendations to Native Americans up front as an executive summary, and then spend the rest of the video breaking it into chapters so you can find those points more easily where you might want to find more detail on the points I'm making. I'm going to give my contact information up front as part of the executive summary and then repeat it at the end if you want to get in touch with me. This is how the Lakotas got in touch with me in the first place. We dialogued for a couple of months and then I came out to their conference. If you go to our homepage, answersingenesis.org slash go slash trace. So Answers in Genesis is a Christian nonprofit. We're not with the government. I don't get government money for my research. I'm relieved to say that. I know there's a long history of abuse from the government with the Native American community. So if you go to this page, Traced comes from a book, book I wrote. It'll take you to a button you can push or you can just scroll down on this page and enter your name, email, message. This goes directly to my inbox and we can begin dialoguing that way. So for Native Americans, especially the tribal leaders, president, council members, here are my seven recommendations as you consider what to do with DNA testing. Number one, the best path forward, I think, for DNA testing as it relates to human history to Native American history is the Y chromosome with a male inherited DNA. Second, there are ways to do DNA testing semi-privately, I say that because that's the least expensive of the options, or completely privately where you build your own labs, but that costs millions of dollars. Number three, Y chromosome testing, and this is perhaps the most exciting part, has validated indigenous histories, including those that previously the mainstream community has dismissed as inauthentic, forgeries, these sorts of things. I'll explain more of that again in the, in the chapter section. Number four, why chromosome testing can fill in gaps in indigenous history. What I, what I don't mean is you take the indigenous histories and then you, you hold it as, as tentative and, and you only take those parts that genetics can directly confirm. No, I'm now with the attitude that I basically accept indigenous histories at the outset as true. You probably know yourselves that some of these histories aren't completely comprehensive I'll give you examples of this again. And so genetics can add to that narrative and complement it. Number five, I'm, again, I'm speaking to you as individual nations, but for reasons I'll explain in the chapter section, every Native American nation 
I can virtually guarantee without knowing anything about your individual histories, are going to have branches from other Native American nations. And so to figure out what does your nation's DNA mean for history, it's essential to have the collaboration, the help of other tribes who are also doing DNA testing say, aha, this is an Iroquoian branch, this is a Navajo branch, this is a, a Lakota branch, and then the pieces begin to come together. Number six, if you're wondering where to start, how much do we need to do to have any hope of getting some sort of answers, I think 100 is a nice round number, a good place to start with 100 men who aren't known to be related, you'll have a lot of information just in that one sample. And I think this is something that's financially doable rather than a thousand or ten thousand or some massive huge price tag study. Number seven, this is more of a question than a recommendation per se. It's a concern of mine for you on your behalf. There are DNA results that are accumulating. There are discoveries that are already being made. I know there's lots of concerns about DNA testing. My concern is if you wait, and all concerns are valid about privacy and these sorts of things. Is the government going to use it against me? Despite all that, my question to you is, my concern for you is someone else might get to your tribe's answer first before you do. It's not a threat what I'm saying. I'm saying there's already a lot of publicly available data out there. People can just sit down, crunch the numbers, and they've got an answer. And then what? What if someone outside your tribe finds the answer before someone inside your tribe does? Then what? It may be advantageous and I know there's lots of risks, to start the process sooner than later to make sure someone doesn't get ahead of it before you do. So that's the executive summary. Now, my background. I have no native blood in my family tree that I know of. It's all Caucasians, Europeans. I grew up in Wisconsin being taught U.S. history, which means I was taught virtually nothing about the pre-Columbian Americas that I know of. It's been a big, big blank spot in my mind for decades. For the last 14 years, I've been working in Christian nonprofits. I began my research studies not with American history, not with human history, but with the question of the origin of species. As research has it, it's unpredictable. I eventually got into the question of human origins about seven or eight years ago. In the last few years, I've been zeroing in on human history via DNA and especially Native American history. Now, the individual, individual recommendations, a bit more of a, a background explanation. Why do I recommend the Y chromosome test in particular? The typical DNA test, the autosomal DNA test that you'd get if you just go to Ancestry DNA, is one that tests DNA that comes from both parents. It's 99% of every person's DNA. It's great in that sense because it gives you both sides of your family tree, but that strength is also its fatal weakness. So the strength is the fact that you do get paternal side and maternal side. Good but it only goes back so far, and here's what I mean. The amount of DNA in each person stays the same from generation to generation. Let's say I've got six billion DNA letters in my cells, in my individual DNA. My children are not gonna have twice that. I don't pass on six billion letters. My wife passes on six billion letters, and so it's 12 billion. In the next generation, 24 billion. It's not like the amount of DNA just keeps ballooning every generation, it stays the same. So that means every parent contributes half of their DNA total DNA, total length of their DNA to each generation, or to put it just simply without getting into all that technical detail I just mentioned, I'm 50% genetically each of my parents. They are also going to abide by the same reproductive, biological, genetic rules. They're 50% genetically each of their parents, which means that I, being descendants of my parents, are 25% genetically each of my grandparents. And if we go back even further and try to squeeze it all on the screen, same rule applies to my grandparents, their parents. So my great-grandparents, I'm 12.5% in theory, genetically each of them. You can see how this number drops off by half. It drops, drops off exponentially every generation. So 50%, 25%, 12.5%, 6.25, .5, about 3%, 1.5%. In just a few generations, there's almost no genetic signal left. We're down at the 1%, less than 1% level, which is hard to analyze with current tools in a way that makes sense. And I should say it's hard to make sense of it even with current tools just because of the way genetic variation exists around the globe. It's, it's hard to define ethnicities with this type of DNA. And so that's a dirty little secret of the genetic testing companies. Their typical test only gives you a few generations of history. 
gives you probably what you already know from your family tree, except you're $100 poor because of it. So there's really two disadvantages of this type of DNA testing. Number one, what I just told you, it only goes back a few generations. The second, which for Native Americans, I'm sure you're concerned about, will the government use this against me? And if the government is going to use something against the Native Americans, let's say they want to use genetics to define tribal roles, to define who gets government money. My guess is they're going to use this type of test much more readily, much more quickly than they use the Y chromosome test. And I'll explain why here in a minute. So that's the second disadvantage I'd say of autosomal. Now the government will find ways, creative ways to abuse the Native American community. And so this is no guarantee they, they won't use the Y chromosome. I just think they're less likely to use it than the autosomal. So what's the advantage then of the Y chromosome besides this question about government interference? Well, if you're going to look deeply in history, you need some sort of DNA that does not get diluted by the other parent's DNA. So the challenge with autosomal is dad's DNA gets diluted by moms or moms gets diluted by dads. We need some sort of DNA that does not get diluted. The Y chromosome fits the bill. Mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited through the female line, in theory would as well, but there's technical statistical issues that I haven't been able to resolve. Everyone has to face them, and I hope I can, face, I can solve them someday. For the time being, the Y chromosome does not have these technical statistical hangups, and so it's very useful. This is inherited only through males from fathers to sons. Females are XX, males are XY. The way in which this records history is that every generation, about three mistakes on average, are passed on from generation to generation. Or what I mean is if you compare my Y chromosome to each of my three boys, you'll find three differences between me and son number one, me and son number two, me and son number three. You'll find differences if you compare my Y chromosome to my dad's, about three differences. If you compare one of my boys to my dad's, their grandfather, two generations difference, you should find three plus three, six differences between them. And so in theory, you can compare the Y chromosomes of any two men around the globe. You can compare the Y chromosomes of any two Native Americans. Count the number of differences between them. And now you've got an estimate. You divide by three or really technically divide by six because from their common ancestor, they each would have had mutations accumulating. You divide by a certain factor and you can then estimate how many generations ago these two men shared a common ancestor. You can also do this for men around the globe. This has been done. This complicated diagram represents the results of a study of 600 men from around the globe, including Native Americans, Europeans, North Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans, Middle Easterners, Central Asians, South Asians, East Asians, Pacific Islanders. It's a good swath of the globe. It represents 600 men, which is why it's hard to see each of these individual tips. So this represents probably 30 men. This whole diagram represents 600. The colors and letter number combinations are just technical shorthand to know where exactly where you are on the tree. Again, I think this type of DNA testing not only gives you deep history, but it's also less likely to be used by the government against you to try to define tribal roles. And, and part of the reason is the, the finicky nature of the Y chromosome history. What I mean is, and I'll give an example from my discussions from many Muslims from North Africa and the Middle East who've contacted me. Many of them want to know, am I connected to Muhammad, to Abraham? Very specific questions I have in mind. And I tell them, because many of them don't have the Abrahamic Y chromosome, I'll say to them, you might still be connected to Abraham. You might have 100 generations back to Abraham, or whatever the number is. And 99 of those 100 generations could be father-son links. But if you have just one exception to this rule, one generation where it's father-daughter, then the person I'm talking to, their Y chromosome is going to be whoever that daughter grows up and marries, not her, not through her dad's line. So this can be thrown off through tiny little exceptions to the rule. It's not a good test of Native American identity, but it is a great tool for investigating history. It just has these quirks. So I, the government surely knows this, and they know it's going to be hard to define tribal roles. Now, could they abuse it? Sure. But Again, it's not as straightforward as the autosomal in terms of defining ethnicity. That's the first recommendation I have if you're considering DNA testing. The second one comes out of a natural follow-up question. Well, what about privacy? I've been able to speak to the retired CEO of uh, Family Tree DNA. was, I think, a formerly a U.S. company. Now, I think Aust an Australian company bought them out. 
So it's based there. I told him I've, I've been in communication with Native Americans, been working with them. There's a huge concern about privacy. He said, okay, yes, we can make an exception to how we normally do things. Now, if you as an individual were to go to Family Tree DNA, purchase a test, you would essentially have to disclose all of your personal information. They need an address to ship the test kit to. So there's that, they have your name, and they're gonna ask you to sign an informed consent form because they don't wanna get sued. And it's just part of standard ethics practice to have someone say, yes, I understand the risks and rewards and being of a sound mind, I still agree to this DNA testing. So he said the research carve out they could make would be so long as there could be a point person who has an institutional review board overseeing what he's doing, someone independent to say that's ethical, that's not ethical. And that point person then is also getting informed consent from all the participants. In other words, so long as I could assure him or someone from your community could assure him that he wouldn't get sued, then they could ship test kits to the point person. The point person could distribute the test kits to the individuals. So only the point person knows their addresses, names, personal information. They ship the test kits back to the point person. Point person sends kits with numbers, but no names, no addresses for the individuals back to the company. The company runs the tests. The point person downloads the data and then tells the individuals what their results are. So that's, that's a semi-private way of doing it. It's cheaper because all you're paying for is the test itself. You're not paying for the equipment. That's the semi-private way, less expensive way of doing DNA testing. If you want to say no, I, I don't even want them to have my sample. What are they going to do with it? Are they going to des destroy it? All those are legitimate concerns, legitimate, legitimate questions. You could build your own lab. Now, I've had an entrepreneur talk with me. He's looked into this because we've explored building our own lab. The price tag is in the millions of dollars. So that's the main drawback of doing it completely privately is, the, is how much it's going to cost you. But there's the option. So each nation might have, each, each of your own nations might have their own preference. I want to communicate to you there are a variety of ways to do it to your preference. Now, back to my own story. The way I finally got connected to Native American history not growing up Native, not having any Native history in my family tree, not being taught Native American history, it was a book about seven, eight years ago I found in the local library here in Northern Kentucky, written by Charles Mann. Now, this, you can find this anywhere in the United States, basically. But uh, 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus. One of Mann's main points is that after Europeans arrived, or I should say before Europeans arrived, there was a very large population Middle of the road estimates put it at 50 to 60 million people up and down the Americas. And after the Europeans arrived, 80 to 90% of them died out. Massive loss of life over several centuries. And then from other sources, I know that in the last century or two, some of the tribes have begun to finally recover some of their former numbers. I was working on the Y chromosome family tree, the male inherited DNA. And this historical fact was resonating in my head and I kept thinking to myself as I was analyzing this tree, where is the smoking gun of this? One of the main questions, two of the main questions I was trying to resolve in looking at the tree at the time was where is the beginning of the Y chromosome tree for the whole globe? And then how is time stamped on this tree? What's the overall time scale? How is time recorded? The Native American history, post-Columbian history, was critical in solving this question. So back to the question of what would the smoking gun be if there was this massive population collapse? I want to show it to you in theory and then show it to you in practice. So let's step away from DNA for a moment and just think about family trees. What if we could watch how family trees changed with time? We basically took a time machine and could look into and just see what's invisible, how people are connected. So I've drawn here a time moving from left to right with pre-Columbian history on this side, post-Columbian on this side, Columbus is right here, this dashed line, 1492. So presumably, if there were 50 to 60 million people in the Americas, there would be population growth that precedes the arrival of Columbus. Population growth in a family tree would look like more and more and more branches accumulating. So we start with a single branch way here on the left and it starts multiplying, multiplying, the sub-branches start multiplying. So by the time you get to 1492, I have 10 branches. Why 10? Because it makes the math easier. After Columbus arrives, I X out nine of them, 90% of them, representing the massive population catastrophe. 
10%, one branch makes it through, and then late in history, 1800s, 1900s, these branches begin to multiply again as the populations begin to resume growth. So that's how it would look like if we had a time machine, if we could just see the invisible, how family trees change with time. Now, let's bring DNA back in. We have the survivors of the population collapse. You Native Americans who are living today are the survivors of the population collapse. What would your DNA look like? And there's really two steps to this. You'd, you'd get DNA, you'd compare it, and that's step one. Step two is then, then you'd reconstruct a family tree. And it's, it's a straightforward process. You just take the number of DNA differences among each of the men, plug them into a computer program, say visualize the DNA differences, and what the program spits out then is what looks like a family tree. It's just a visual depiction of mathematical differences that looks very much like a family tree. What would your DNA look like if there's a population collapse? So what I've just said is we're taking DNA from the survivors, not those who were there at the collapse. They died. They don't have descendants because whole villages are gone. So if you were to take DNA from these guys, you wouldn't have access to all these branches. All you would have is this long line in which back in history there were branches coming off, but we don't see them anymore because all those people died. What you see the smoking gun of a population collapse is flatlining. Of course, in the medical field, when we talk about flatlining, it's, we're talking about a heart monitor, heartbeat monitor that's going up and down, up and down. If it starts flatlining, the heart has stopped and we're in big danger. So there's a, there's a helpful double meaning here. When there's flatlining in the family tree, big danger, big population collapse. So all this is in theory. This is a hypothetical. What do we see in the branches of Native Americans today? And there's, again, already been published data for them. In this particular study that I want to show you, this is from that same 600-member study that the Native Americans who are part of this particular study were from the Pima Indians in southwest U.S., northwest Mexico, from the Mayans and I think, Guatemala, Colombians, the Caritianos and Suris. These are Amazonian peoples from Brazil. Here's 1492. Here's pre-Columbus, post-Columbus. What do you see? Flatlining, 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 flatlining all over the place. Once you see it, it's hard to unsee it. And then later in history, we see that the branches begin to multiply again. And if you were to graph this out, it would look like this. There's, it's not one single line. There's sort of a, a shaded area because there, there's statistical noise and all this. But you can see the, the branch. Here's the population size. Here's every century. So as we go through the centuries, pre-Columbus, the, the, this population growth curve goes up. Then it flatlines before and after Columbus because it was such a massive collapse. And then it starts growing again. This was a huge discovery. It helped me anchor and, and find the beginning, eventually, of the Y chromosome tree, as well as anchor the time scale, what this implied. The only way we could see this population flatlining and recovery is if we had a dramatically shortened time scale of just a few thousand years for all of human history. That's not conventional. That's not mainstream. But what's also not conventional is that this new time scale confirmed indigenous histories. The mainstream timescale doesn't. This new revised timescale does. Let me give you one of the most egregious examples. This is a book cover from a 1993 translation of the Delaware or Lenny Lenape Red Record, or it's also called the Wallum Olam. This was discovered or supposedly given to a Kentuckian in the early 1800s by a Delaware man. He, he did his own translations. Others have done translations and analysis over the past roughly two centuries. And I think it's largely been viewed as a curious document, perhaps with some historical information in it. All that changed in 1995 when a man by the name of Ostreicher published his PhD thesis on this in anthropology and argued that the Red Record, the Wallam Olam, was in fact a forgery by this Kentucky guy, not authentic history at all. And, the, and Ostreicher was so persuasive that the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma rescinded its endorsement, I think that's O. Stryker's comments, explanation, of their, uh, of the red record. So that had been the status then since 95, roughly. No, this is not an authentic history. Well, fast forward about 25 years to the research I've been doing, and lo and behold, this revised times goes, why chromosome history confirms the history recorded in the red record. As far as I, I don't have answers for all of O. Stryker's arguments, but as best as I can tell, this is real history, and I'll tell you about more that has flowed from this since then. Now, I, of course, had questions. Is this 
a fluke? Is this in fact real? Is this a general pattern? And I can tell you that since then, we've looked at Aztec histories, an example of a Central American history, the Codex Chima Popoca. This is also confirmed by this revised timescale. North American example, Central American example. What about South America? The Incans, one of the main kingdoms, they also have their own indigenous history. One of the conquistadors, Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa, has a remarkable account of this. He went to the Incan elders, talked about there being written records, consulted, I think, 100 people, consolidated their history, read it aloud in the public square, basically a form of peer review. So late 1500s, this guy is doing, in a sense, modern science with that level of accountability and then published it. Now, he begins by giving his own 1500s, I think, Catholic version of what he thinks the history of the Americas are, and then gets into the Incan section and calls it, I think, a fable. So he's obviously dismissive. He's not reading his own ideas into it and then describes their history. Well, their history is also confirmed by this new genetic discovery. And there's more examples of this, but I just wanted to whet your appetite. There's really exciting, I think, for Native American communities validation in genetics with this revised timescale with the Y chromosome, the male inherited DNA. The fourth point now that I want to make is that Y chromosome testing can fill in gaps. And what I mean is not that we dismiss all the examples until we find genetic confirmation. Again, I'm now at the stage where I just assume that the indigenous histories are true because I've seen so many of them play out this way, but not all of them are comprehensive. For example, in the red record, it talks about a, a crossing of the Bering Strait. I'm not saying all indigenous histories say this, but this is one example of it. And then a very detailed migration throughout northern and then western and then central and eastern North America. 96 sachems are part of this record. For the sachem who leads the people across the Bering Strait, there is not an explicit timestamp. Later sachems talk about events to which we can use outside sources to give dates. So there's wampum records that talk about when they first arrived on the Atlantic after crossing the entire breadth of the United States and, and North America. There is a sachem in the red record who talks about first arriving on the Atlantic. So, okay, that sachem lived probably then at this date. The red record ends with them seeing white people, they say. Who, who are they? The guy who translated this work in 93, McCutcheon, identifies this with the Dutch arrival in 1620. So then you've got two sachems, two dates. You can calculate the amount of sachems between these two dates, calculate an average length of time for how long each sachem ruled, and then back calculate to get to an estimated date from when the Delawares, you know, I would actually argue the Algics in, in general, arrived in the Americas. I went through that really quickly. I've got other videos that show you the details of this. The point is there's a couple different spots where you can estimate going backwards in time, extrapolating when the Delawares arrived, but there's several centuries of possibilities. So how do you resolve this? I can tell you that we've been able to identify the genetic lineage of the Al Algonquin and the Algic peoples. From that family tree genetic confirmation, we can put a date then. It's it, it, of, these, of this range of centuries, it actually shows it's the 900s. Once we can anchor the beginning of the narrative, we can fill in the, then dates from major events elsewhere in the narrative. This has been huge because it's allowed us to then compare this record to the records of other members of the same language family to which the Delawares belong, the Algic language family. So this includes Blackfeet, Cheyenne, Potawatomi, Shawnee, others. From their own histories, we've been able to line all of this up. We've got a comprehensive account now of the origin and migration of the Algic and Algonquin peoples. We've also been able to take these, and I'm going through this quickly because I've, I've covered this in detail in other videos, we've, able, we've been able to go to major events in archaeology. For example, the rise and fall of the greatest city north of the Rio Grande, Cahokia, in the late 1200s, the, the Red Record talks about this. So from archaeology, we know the city reached its height in the 1000s to 1200s. We know from archaeology that after it fell, a Another group of mounds, which I've actually been able to visit in Moundville, Alabama, rose and came to prominence. The Red Record talks about defeating the Cahokians and then those guys going south. They call them the Telegas. They went south. Anyway, there's just all sorts of confirmations here in archaeology. The last exciting point I want to make here, just quickly, is that these accounts talk to one another. The indigenous histories talk to one another. The Red Record talks about 
why they went to Kochi in the first place, because there was battles they were fighting on the plains. They just got tired of it. One of the battles they talked about was fighting the North Walkers. Who's that? It's a very picturesque description. If you follow where they traveled, the land they went through initially was likely Athabascan country. There was a major conflagration up here. And then they battle again the North Walkers. My guess is North Walkers because they encountered these people before in the north. And this is pre-horses from the Europeans, so the people are moving by walking. We know from the Athabascans' own history, they did migrate south. And at contact, the Navajos and the Apaches, who are Athabascans, were in the southwest. The Mescalero Apaches describe a migration in great detail from the north to the south and have a date on it. So, and the Mescalero is about the late 1300s. But they say there were three groups who preceded them, which means then they probably preceded them in time, maybe the 1300s, early 1300s, maybe even the 1200s, which would be directly in line then with when the Delawares, the Algics, were saying we fought these North Walkers on the plains. There's crosstalk and independent confirmation, I think, of these various indigenous histories. So that's all wrapped up here in this fourth point, the Y chromosome testing can fill in these gaps. All those points that I just mentioned are largely a result of being able to anchor the Delaware Red Record in time, and we were able to do so with genetics. Now, fifth point, fifth recommendation. Why, do, why does each individual Native American nation likely need the collaboration, the help of other Native American nations? It's not because I've got some inside track to what every nation has been saying. It's because of the basic facts of human reproduction. We are sexually reproducing species, not asexual. We're not bacteria. I can't just pop off a copy of myself. I have two parents. My parents themselves, being humans, had two parents. So I have four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, and, and on the list goes. I cover this kindergarten point when talking about autosomal DNA. I want to make a different point now with these similar facts. If you run the numbers backwards in time, so let's say one generation represents 25 years because it makes the math simple. From birth to then fathering the next generation, 25 years, age of marriage, let's say, and, and becoming a father. That's a nice number because then we can say in one century, there's four generations. Four times 25 is 100. So in, a, in 10 centuries, 1,000 years, 10 times four per century would be 40 generations. 1,000 years ago, 40 generations ago, how many ancestors did I have, did you have? Notice the pattern. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. The numbers start slow, but they grow huge. If you run the math with a calculator, you will find out that you have billions of ancestors just 1,000 years ago. Why does that matter? 600 years ago, the AD 1400s, the entire population of the globe was not in the billions, but the millions. So what I've just told you then is a mathematical contradiction. Every single individual going back in time in just a thousand years has billions of ancestors. Yet the world population is only in the millions or less as you go deeper in time. How do you resolve that mathematical discrepancy? It's tempting to say, well, we'll just remove some ancestors from every person's family tree. You, you can't do that. You kill them off, and one of your ancestors then is not going to exist, and if one of your ancestors doesn't exist, one of the parents of your parents of your parents of your parents, you don't exist, yet you do. You're watching this video. So how do you resolve this? You resolve it by connecting the branches. My mother's side and my father's side must connect in the last 1,000 years to make the math work. That's true for you and your family, it's true for every single individual on this planet. It's true for nations. What the, what the general rule is that I've been able to see globally is that unless there is a profound barrier to migration, like the Sahara Desert or a vast ocean, people who are neighbors are going to have family tree branches that connect. They have to connect because of this math. So you are going to have in your own nation branches that connect to other nations just because of this math. And so to figure out what all the branches in your nation represent and the history that it represents, you'll need intertribal collaboration. Sixth recommendation, where should I start? This is overwhelming. How many people? 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000? 
with 100, that's that's a reasonable amount of money. I say that because let's just run the math. If let's say you use family tree DNA, you decide to go the semi-private route, and you use family tree DNA, you say I'm going to purchase your individual Y chromosome test, the full sequence. It's about $450 per person. If you want the raw data, which I'd recommend, it's another $100, so it's $550 price and the prices change there's sales that they run but we'll use that just to get an estimate 550 times 100 is $55,000 it's a lot of money but it's still way less than millions of dollars if you build your own lab 100 men will also give you a very good snapshot of what the nation as a whole looks like you can run percentages then uh, and it, it, it's just a good start it gives you a good sense with each nation's population history Anyway, just for a number of reasons, I think it's a good starting point. Once you get the initial framework, then you'll want to expand that. And I think if people catch the vision for it, they'll may want to participate more. But this is, I think, just a good round number. Now, the seventh recommendation, sort of the question, the concern I've had is, and I'm going to give you the backstory to this real quick. I'm going to run through some technical detail real fast, but then just summarize it for you. The way in which I w we were able to identify the algic language family branch was simply from publicly available data. We have census numbers for Canada and the United States. I know what percentage of First Nations in Canada, what percentage of Native Americans in the United States today are represented by the Algic peoples. Family Tree DNA in the summer, I think of 2022, released their 200,000 member data set of Y chromosome testers. There are Native American branches in that data set. They are assigned to the US or Canada or Mexico and other political entities, not Native American nations. You don't, know, you don't have a branch that says, oh, this is from the Cherokee. This is from the Navajo. So all I can run is numbers, but those numbers are sufficient where I was able to find a correlation between the algic census numbers in Canada, the algic percentage of branches in the family tree DNA data set, the algic branches in the United States, the algic percentage of branches in the family tree DNA data set. There was a strong correlation. I identified one of these branches as algic on that basis. I can identify, in, in a previous video, identify the Athabascan branch because, again, there's, there's a correlation between the percentage of Native Americans who are in the AAC Athabascan language family, and there's a branch that is found at similar levels. This particular branch also has branches that connect to Mexico. So if you're saying, well, 24% is also close to Iroquoian, sure, but the Iroquoians were in the east. The Athabascans had members who were close to the modern Mexican border, and perhaps the final confirming point is there was a Navajo code talker who gave a sample of his DNA before he died. He's also in this particular branch. I can make a strong case that this is the Athabascan branch. Again, the point of all this is if I, if someone like me can sit at my desk with a computer and just crunch some numbers and find an answer, imagine how much easier it is for well-funded entities, government organizations, anyone to just run through the publicly available data and identify branches. So my concern is, if that's how easy the general public can do it, you may be at a disadvantage if you wait. Again, not a threat, it's just a concern saying it may be helpful to consider getting ahead of this curve rather than falling behind. To get in touch with me, I'd love to be able to help any way I can. Uh, paid my own way to go to the Lakota conference. I'd like to be a help. And I'll tell you why here in a minute. The way to get in touch with me again is to go to ancestorsgenesis.org slash go slash traced. There'll be a button you can click on or you can just simply scroll down on the screen to get to a spot where you can enter your name, email, message. It goes directly to my inbox. You can also get in touch with me on social media. I've got a number of accounts because I don't know which one's going to kick me off, but I use it for to, to communicate with people. I did reference a video series. If you go to our Answers in Genesis YouTube homepage and go to the Playlists tab, you will find a playlist called The Lost History of North America. If you click on that, you should find a page that looks somewhat like this. We've done five videos in the series. We're going to add this to this series, make it the sixth one. Now, you might ask, why, why do I care? Why should I, as a Caucasian, be interested in offering help to the Native American community? I grew up knowing next to nothing, as I mentioned earlier, about the Native American history. And as far as I'm concerned, my guess is the vast majority of my Caucasian peers, the Caucasian world that I've swam in for years, has grown up the same way. They don't know what happened prior to Europeans. 
and many of them don't even know that Native Americans still exist. And my desire is that that situation changes, that they learn to respect the heroes and battles and empires and, and ruins of those who came before and care about those who remain. Not that they become some sort of white savior and help the Native American community out. I don't have any plans other than Native America, other than Caucasians leave you Native Americans alone. But if you don't know they exist, how can anyone care? And I want them to care. Some of this research I've told you about has also been published in a book. The initial stages of it, Traced Human DNA's Big Surprise, came out in March of 2022. It did a series of videos asking for participants in exploring this. That's how I got in touch with the Lakotas. I've got contacts now in about 40 different nations, but would love to see the tribes catch the vision for it, get excited for it, and take ownership of it, and run, run, run with it themselves. So if there's any way I can be of help, I would love to. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Lost History of North America. I've got a book I'm working on right now that focuses very heavily on synthesizing genetics and archaeology with the Native American histories. I hope it'll be a great service and asset to the Native American community. We'll do a, uh, uh, make great progress in educating the Caucasian community on who came before on building respect for them. Thank you again.